Good evening, it's 8 o'clock. I'm Sally Burdett, live from Johannesburg. Your top stories this evening. Supporters of the Please Call Me inventor say he deserves billions. The mobile operator says their offer is more than fair. More Bosasa executives testify at the Zondo Commission, dropping more high-profile names allegedly involved in dodgy dealings. And shockwaves in Worcester as a woman appears in court over the abuse of 12 children who were chained up in a container. The row over how much money Vodacom owes the Please Call Me inventor continues to grow. Now, the telecoms giant has profited from Nkosana Makati's idea. His supporters today descended on the company's head office, calling for him to be paid tens of billions of rand. But Vodacom says their current offer is more than generous. Our reporter John Bailey has the latest. Between 7 billion and 70 billion rand. That's how much some analysts are saying Vodacom owes Nkosana Makati. The company is reportedly offering him 49 million rand as a settlement for his please call me idea. That's even though Vodacom's admitted to the constitutional court, it's still raking in billions via the service. Makati and the company reportedly reached a verbal agreement that he'd receive 15% of the revenue generated from his invention. But Makati is saying to date, he's received no money and hasn't agreed to any deal. One thing that's angered many is that Vodacom's former CEO, Alan Knott Craig, lied in his autobiography, claiming the free message service was his idea. Something the Constitutional Court found no difficulty in rejecting. In 2016, the court ordered Vodacom to enter into negotiations with Makati to determine a reasonable settlement. Despite extensive talks lasting nearly a year and a half, the two parties couldn't come to terms. The court then ruled it was up to Vodacom CEO to make a determination. But the rumoured 49 million rand on offer has been rejected. The determination of the CEO, from my perspective, was considerably generous. And I think he was brave and had courage to make a determination. Makate is now taking the matter back to court. Civil society and some politicians continue to show him strong support. John Bailey, Johannesburg. To Worcester now, and what appears to be a horrifying case of mass child abuse. A 54-year-old woman is being investigated for the abuse of 12 children. Now, we are not identifying her at this stage as it may reveal the children's identity. The Western Cape Department of Social Development says she's the mother of one of the 12 children and the other children seem to have been placed in her care. The children are aged between 2 and 16. They were found chained and tied up in a container outside Worcester last week. They've now been moved to a place of safety. The department says they've had medical checkups and their parents have been contacted. The suspect will appear in court again on February the 13th. This after the case was postponed this morning for further investigation. Moving to the northwest now, and the two men who killed 16 year old Matlomola Moshweo allegedly over a stolen sunflower are pleading for a lenient sentence. Today, their lawyers put forward arguments in mitigation of sentence. Malung Boy reports on a crime that has torn the town of Kulini apart. Matlomola Moshweo died after he was thrown from a moving bucky near Kulini. Peter Dorovald's lawyer says the crime was not racially motivated. She believes the court must acknowledge he was not the one who threw Mushwewu from the vehicle. She says the incident has taken a toll, leaving her client depressed. At the same time, Philip Scudder's advocate says he's also haunted by the incident, so much so that he's lost about 40 kilograms. He's also pointed to the fact that Skirter has no previous criminal history. Both lawyers say they don't believe life sentences will help the community. 
But the state is saying Duravalt and Skerte acted with common purpose in killing Moshwewu. The prosecutors describing it as a barbaric act that polarized the Kolini community along racial lines. This, the state believes, means that the two should rot in jail. It says the fact that the two accused lied in court means they can't be rehabilitated. Community members are watching the case closely. But a stiffer sentence, it will be a deterrent to those hooligans outside there who still want to do this thing. Look, this country, as I used to say, it needs everybody. For us, for us to build it, you need everybody. Now all eyes are on Judge Ronnie Hendricks to decide what punishment befits the crime. Sentencing will take place on the 6th of March. Malungi Lubui, Mahi Geng. The state capture inquiry has heard another list of names of people involved with Busasa, the facilities management company that holds multiple government contracts. Today, Pretoria Magistrate Desmond Nair was among those cited as an alleged beneficiary of security upgrades and maintenance paid for by Busasa. Now, he is meeting his lawyer tomorrow. Nair's name joins those of two sitting ministers, a deputy minister, the former chair of SAA's board and an ANC MP. Here's Aaron Bates. Both witnesses who appeared before the Zondo Commission on Thursday did so after being issued summonses. Richard LaRue is currently employed at an IT subsidiary of what was Bosasa. He claims that Gavin Watson threatened him and his daughter Lindsay Watson pressured him into only implicating Angelo Agrizzi in the establishment of a special projects unit. We were not allowed to wear any uniform. We had to wear civilian clothing. Okay. So that nothing, 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 not even the vehicles yes. could get pointed back to Sundolo IT okay. at all, all the Busasa group. At. LaRue rattled off a list of names of people he claims received upgrades and maintenance to security systems at their personal homes, all paid for by Busasa. They include Minister Gwede Mantashe, Minister Nombula Mokonyane, former SAA Chair Dudu Mieni, and ANC MP Vincent Smith. But perhaps most alarming and unfamiliar was the name of a magistrate. A Mr. Desmond Ne. At whose instruction? Trevor, Trevor Matenja instructed Angelo Gritzi, who instructed me. LaRue also testified that he received instructions to destroy video footage of VIPs and VVIPs. I had seen the then President Jacob Zuma, accompanied by Dudu Moyeni and Becky Clearly. I had to wait until the visit was finished and I had to clear the database then and there. After LaRue came Leon Fantonde, who used to work at IT for Bosasa and some of its subsidiaries. Fantonde, who is the younger brother of the company's former CFO, testified that he, under duress, destroyed documents. The documents I had to search for was documents that was related to the Bosasa or to, related to the tenders that was awarded to by the Department of Correctional Services. With these two witnesses' testimony, there are now five versions before the Zondo Commission implicating Bosasa in allegations of fraud, corruption, money laundering, and yes, state capture. And it's expected there'll be more of the same on Friday at 10 when a new witness takes the stand. Aaron Bates, Johannesburg. And if you're wondering why the mounting testimony about corruption emerging from the Zondo Commission is not leading to immediate prosecution or at least arrests, perhaps another commission can help answer that. The Mokhoro inquiry is probing suspended advocates Nomnobo Jiba and Lawrence Pwebi. And in the process, seems to be uncovering just how dysfunctional the National Prosecuting Authority really is. No doubt this is top of mind for incoming NPA boss Shamila Batoy, who starts tomorrow. Here's Govan Whittles on today's testimony from Deputy NPA Head Willy Hofmeyer. Willy Hofmeyer is so far the most senior NPA official to testify against Nomtobo Jiba and Lawrence Mkhwebi. He says it appears as Jiba and Mkhwebi had been trying to sabotage the NPA's work. It's incredibly difficult to have people working in the organization who at the end of the day are either spying on the organization to give information to accused people or trying to, to sabotage its work in various ways. 
He's told the inquiry Jiba and Mkwebi supported former National Police Commissioner Jackie Salebi's bid for a stay of prosecution. That application ultimately failed. Hofmeyer is also accusing Jiba of being involved in a plot to target high-ranking police officers and prosecutors. Something he says that was also taken up by former NPA boss Sean Abrams. I think my problem is that uh, once you start manipulating Manipulating the outcome of cases to please politicians, that ends up uh, being a disaster for the NPA, as we have seen over the last few years. The inquiry has now formally requested Abrams to appear and respond to Hofmeyer's claims. Govan Whittles, Centurion. Still ahead on E! News, the death toll from the Brazil Dam tragedy has now risen to 99 and more than 250 people are still missing. And in business, the rand has clawed back its way up to a seven-month high. We'll look at some of the major drivers. Let's talk business now with Rofiwa Madzena. Evening to you, Rofiwa. As the outcry over the Please Call Me saga continues, I'm wondering what Vodacom share price is doing. So today in particular, it was a bit of a mixed day for it. It traded lower for most part of the morning, but was able to claw back some of those losses later in the day. So we've seen that this week it's fallen from about um, 129 rand a share down to 120 a share. So in the last two weeks, it's lost about 12% of its value. And yesterday, after the news was coming out about the strike and closing of some of those stores, it fell uh, by just 1.2%. So it's been a significant fall for the, for the company, especially in two weeks. Absolutely. Um, staying with mobile operators, some good news coming from MTN for their customers. They're cutting their bundle rates. I'm wondering why they're doing that now, if they're capitalizing strategic, a little. Strategic, I would think. Strategic, <laughs> I would think, as um, Vodacom um, users want to move to alternative mobile providers. But yes, they are cutting their out-of-bundle uh, data rates. So if you're a prepaid customer, you're now going to be paying 29 cents per megabyte for the data that you buy. And if you're buying a bundle, you'll be paying 49 cents uh, per megabyte and it's a significant uh, milestone given that data, mis uh, f data fees must fall has been such a big talking point in Absolutely. the country so we go and um, the CEO attributes this to a really good conversation that's happening between government ICASA and the mobile network operators in terms of opening up that spectrum so, so it's getting slowly better but slowly what's not getting slowly better it seems is the coal situation for ESCOM I thought we were through the coal crunch it seems three power stations are in crisis. No, absolutely not. So ESCOM today put out an announcement. The COO actually said they've got less than 10 days of coal available at three of their power plants. They didn't specify which those were, but we're going to possibly be seeing some power cuts. And of course, this is not good for your miners and manufacturers. No, not at all. Take us through the markets, if you would. Please. Let's have a look at those markets there. So today we saw an interesting trading day because after a positive start to the day, the JSC closed flat and it was weighed down by a push showing from some of those miners. Meanwhile, retailers and banks had a positive close. On the commodities front, the oil price continues to rise and it's set to end the month by posting the biggest January gain on record. Gold was also up as it remains the safe haven asset, while platinum remains below 900 US dollars. Onto the currency now, the local unit. The dovish US federal stance message last night boosted sentiment towards risk assets, with the rand firming about 30 cents against the US dollar. Thank you very much, uh, Rufi Wim. Thank you. Let's move to international news now. And the United States continues to battle freezing weather in some parts of the Midwest. Temperatures have dropped as low as minus 41 degrees Celsius. A blast of icy polar air has been responsible for at least 12 deaths now. Railways, to try and keep trains moving, have had to ignite tracks with flames to stop those tracks from shrinking in the extreme cold that is being experienced in America at the moment.
The death toll in the Brazil dam collapse has risen to 99. It's estimated 259 people still missing. The dam burst at an iron ore mine owned by mining giant Vale. Now, the dam rupture caused a mudslide, releasing torrents of mining waste that has ripped through a nearby community. Meanwhile, Brazilian authorities have arrested five people in connection with the disaster. Three of them are Vale employees. The European Union Parliament has recognized Juan Guaido as Venezuela's interim president. The parliament is the first European institution to do so and has called on others to follow suit to deliver a strong, unique European position. Guaido announced himself as acting president, directly challenging President Nicolas Maduro, who is serving his second six-year term in office. Now, as the tides change, South Africa is still sticking to its position, recognizing Maduro as the country's rightful president. Now, after the break, we're going to go to our weather centre with Joel standing by. And then, lanterns illuminate the sky in China ahead of the Chinese New Year. Let's get your weather now with Joel Guy in Cape Town. Evening, Joel. How's it looking? Good evening, Sally, and welcome to the Weather Center, everyone. Well, we have stormy weather that is going on across the eastern half of the country, as well as rain showers over parts of the Eastern Cape and KwaZulu Natal. Now, this unsettled weather continues into Friday morning, and then throughout the day on Friday, we are going to see isolated to scattered thunderstorms setting in all the way from the western interior into much of eastern South Africa, pushing down into the Eastern Cape and KwaZulu Natal. There will be a bit of rain as for parts of the south coast and the southern areas of the Eastern Cape. Then as we go through Friday night, we will continue to see unsettled weather across much of the interior, but things are going to dry out on Saturday and Friday night across much of the Limpopo province. Now here's taking it closer to your part of the country. We are going to be seeing isolated thunder shows on Friday for much of the northern Cape. It will stay pretty hot for the province, Uppington, warming to around 39 degrees. Partly cloudy skies are forecast for the southern areas of the Western Cape with a little bit of rain between Bredastop and George, where high of 23 is forecast. On the other hand, it will be sunny and hot for Cape Town, Thunder shows for Beaufort West and also on. We are going to see isolated to scattered thunderstorms across the park of the Eastern Cape where top temperatures in the lower 20s are forecast in most areas. Very unsettled weather continues for much of KwaZulu Natal. It will be warm for the province with Deben warming to around 25 degrees. So will Port Shepstone a little bit warmer for the northeastern areas. Stormy weather is also forecast across much of Mpumalanga. It's going to be warm for the high field but hotter as we go towards Mbombe and Skukuza. We are also going to see thunder showers over the western areas of the Limpopo province, mostly sunny and hot, however, for the eastern areas. Polokwane should warm to around 28 degrees. Thunderstorms are also focused across the northwest, where highs in the upper 20s and lower 30s are focused in most areas. Rustenburg peaking at around 31 degrees. We are also going to see isolated to scattered thunderstorms across much of the free state. It will be warm to hot in most areas, but rather mild for Bethlehem and Harry Smith. Gauteng should should also see thundery showers on a Friday afternoon with a warm to hot afternoon temperatures. Pretoria making it to around 29 degrees. Now here's looking ahead to your Saturday. We are going to see stormy weather across much of the country. Then on Sunday, light rain for Cape Town and George and thunder showers for the rest of the country. That's all from the Weather Centre. Over to you. Thanks very much, Joel. Lots of lightning about. We've got to be really careful. And finally, colourful lanterns have been lighting up the night sky in China's Shangxi province ahead of the Chinese New Year celebrations. Locals and tourists have been flocking to the small county to see the lanterns which come in all different shapes and sizes. The new Chinese, the Chinese New Year rather, will be cele celebrated on the 5th of February. Isn't that beautiful? <laughs> And let's recap your top story this evening. Supporters of the Please Call Me Inventor say he deserves billions. The mobile operator says their offer, rumoured to be around 49 million rand, is more than fair. From me and the team, it's a very good night. <laughs>